Hey guys, this is Jules. Welcome back to Code School. Andrew is buried under covers right now with the plague, so he won't be joining us today. But let's all wish him a speedy recovery. Also, since today is a holiday here in the States, I've decided to show my patriotism. I wish all of you celebrating with me today a happy and safe 4th of July. Today I'm going to back up a bit and explain how Pygame works because there is some new terminology that is probably a little confusing. In Code Sculpture we only had one frame, one canvas, and all our drawing was done with draw commands like draw text or draw circle. In Pygame already we've seen things like display, surface, screen, frame, canvas, draw, blip, flip, and render. You may be wondering what exactly these things are and what they do. To begin, display is simply the size of your window. This will hold everything the player sees. All the drawing in Pygame is done on a surface. Surface is a rectangular shape that can hold an image of something, like a picture, a drawing, or text. Unlike the simple GUI frame, surfaces do not have draw handlers. Instead, we set up our own main loop and call any methods we want from there. Just like simple GUI had to have the draw handler function, in Pygame we have to have a main loop that handles our drawing. Screen, frame, and canvas are just synonyms we've used to refer to a surface that is the same size as our display window. You can use whatever word you like, but you need one main surface that is the same size as your display. You can have as many surfaces as you want, you can draw on any of them, and they can stack on top of each other. But eventually, all your surfaces have to be copied to your main surface. This is because only one surface gets displayed to the user, the one returned by display set mode that we call display and display gets all its information about what to draw from our main surface only. But we might want to be drawing to other surfaces. Indeed, some drawing always results in a new surface, font render, for example. There's no other way to draw text, so we need some way to transfer contents of one surface to another, if only so we can draw text on our main surface. The method that does this is surface split. Finally, we come to display flip. To understand this, you need to understand what double buffering is. You might already know that the processes of drawing anything to the screen can be very taxing on your processor. Graphics require a lot of physical memory, as well as a lot of computations to present the images in the right place in the right colors at the right time. A problem that can happen is that while your processor is handling all the math to draw the next image and handle game logic, the image you have on the screen in the meantime doesn't change. If the processes take longer than the time between frames, you can get static, or what I like to call hiccups, where the player will see a flash of a white screen, for example, or one part of the image will take longer to draw and the screen will appear cut in half. The way Pygame addresses this problem is with double buffering. What this does is it creates two layers, a front buffer and a back buffer. The front buffer includes everything that the player sees. The back buffer is where Pygame draws everything. When all the drawing is complete, Pygame flips the two buffers so now the back buffer becomes the front buffer. The transition is seamless to the player because the work of drawing is all done before the image is shown on the screen. So as far as the programming side of things, we use draw to tell Pygame to draw something on the surface it should be drawn to. Then we blit all of these onto our main surface. Blit is just a geeky word for make a pixel copy. At this point, the back buffer is ready with our screen image. So we tell it to flip the display, and this makes the front and back buffers change places. The last thing we haven't covered yet is rendering. You might have seen when we draw text in Pygame, we have to do something called render to it. What this does is it takes the element, in this case a group of characters, and it creates a surface containing pixels that make up an image of these characters. It's kind of similar to comparing a text document to a PDF of that same document. The PDF is like a snapshot of the document. When we render text, we are basically just creating a snapshot of it. So in our process, we render the text before we draw it. In fact, the sooner you can render the text you're going to use, the better. You can store the text as images so that later, when they are needed, all the hard part is already done. This really speeds up the process. Also, once you save the text image, you won't have to render that text again. So the only step that needs to be repeated will be drawing it. Okay, now that we understand all of these new things, let's talk about how we actually do this in Pygame. We always begin by initializing Pygame and setting up the clock. We must have the clock because it controls the speed that the objects are drawn. If we don't use the clock, during moments of little activity, the objects would be drawn faster, and then during complicated processing tasks, the objects would be drawn slower. 
When we are dealing with animated objects, that would not be good. One moment it might move so slowly we could see every frame, while the next it would seem to teleport to a new location without the intermediary steps between. Once we initialize and set up the clock, we then create our display window and set our caption. Next, we'll create our main surface. You can call this screen or frame or canvas or whatever you like, but just remember that this is your main surface where everything will eventually need to be drawn or blitted to. The next step is dependent on what kinds of things you are doing. This is where you would load images you need or create font objects or sound objects. These things aren't drawn or played yet, but simply stored in RAM so they can be accessed quickly later when needed. The final step is to create the main loop. This loop is an infinite loop with conditional statements that allow us to break out of the loop when the game is over. Andrew demonstrated in the first week how to do that. The first thing your main loop should do is fill the main surface with one color to effectively erase everything on it. Then you will call all your draw commands. Objects can be drawn directly to the main surface or onto their own surfaces. Anything not drawn to the main surface needs to also be blitted to the main surface. Next comes event handling. This is where you will check for any input from the user, such as mouse events or keyboard events or joystick events. This is also where you will check for the user exiting so you can shut down the program. Once you have addressed all the events you want to check for, the last thing you have to do is flip the display to the screen and tick the clock. Always make sure the clock is the last thing you do in the main loop. The number inside the parentheses is the frames per second. This should usually be set to 30 for most games. Okay, so our philosophy is draw each component on a separate surface, then blit as necessary. This way, you can test individual components in isolation, and each component can be moved or animated separately from everything else. Hopefully now you have a better understanding of the steps and what each thing relates to. Now I'm going to show a little more about the code you are working with this week. I briefly explained PG Extra in Sunday's video, but I didn't spend any time going over the code for 20 questions. Let's do that now. The Code Sculptor version of 20 questions is not as complicated as it may look. It's just a few state classes and one UI class that handles all the graphical elements. Here we have the UI class. It has six methods. These should all look familiar. The one thing to note is that the add input, add label, and add button methods all list a parameter they don't use called location. This is because Simple GUI didn't use location on these control objects, but in other GUIs, and specifically Pygame, the location is not predetermined. We are anticipating moving this game to Pygame, so we are preemptively adding this parameter now, as we know it will be necessary later. The state class is the base class for all the other state classes. The init method creates a UI instance. The start method creates a frame. Notice, though, that it delegates the work to the UI instance. You'll also notice that we have some methods that don't have anything in them. We call these hooks. They are necessary methods, but for this base class, we don't want them to actually do anything. This isn't as apparent in Code Sculptor because our state class is setting our draw handler to its own draw method and calling its own mySetup method. But later, when we move to Pygame, this won't be the case the UI class will be responsible for calling these two methods. If we didn't include them in the state base class, we would get an error. For general purposes, you just need to know that a hook is an empty method that a child class can override. In the child state classes, my setup is where the objects like buttons, labels, and input fields are created. The draw method is used for any other elements we want to draw to the screen, like text. We don't have to draw the objects from my setup here because their draw methods are now handled by the UI class. Notice that the draw text call we are using in the draw method is also being delegated to the UI class. The rest of the methods in each class handle the game logic, including handling state transitions. The Pygame version of 20 questions is very similar to the Code Sculptor version. The differences revolve around two points. Number one, you can save and load the questions so the question tree is actually able to grow. And number two, we are using Pygame now. Let's consider the similarities first. If you compare the state classes to those in the Code Sculptor version, you will notice that there is very little difference. This is because we separated the UI logic from the game logic in our Code Sculptor version already. 
The only differences have to do with dealing with changes that have to do with the UI class. Most of these were due to unexpected differences between CodeSculptor and Pygame. There is one other difference, though. The state-based class now has a new hook, the quit method. This will allow child classes to clean up before transitioning and when the game exits. Let's look at other differences now. First, File Helper. This class is responsible for opening, loading, and saving the question tree. It uses the Pickle module, which is very handy for persisting pretty much any object in Python. A new game start state was also added to handle the initialization of the game state. Because we can now load and save the question tree, we need a state to handle this process. The UI class got the majority of the changes. You can see that our init method grew quite a lot. We have more attributes to add to handle additional parameters, and we also added two lists to hold all the buttons and all the text input fields so we can iterate through them later as needed. Then we initialize Pygame and create our display and our screen or main surface. Also notice the target attribute. This is so we can keep a reference to the current state. This will allow us to call methods on the correct state in the main loop. The start method is also more involved than before. Notice it contains an actual game loop, unlike the CodeSculptor version. First, the start method gets the current state to create its controls. This part is not within the game loop because the controls only need to be created once. The first item in the game loop is a call to fill the screen. Remember, this basically acts as an eraser, so the screen always starts completely empty. Next is the event handler for Pygame, which checks for events. In our handler, we are passing the handling to the methods for the specific type of object. So we iterate through our text input list and our button list and call the check event method for each. Then we do the same thing with the draw method. Each control is responsible for checking its own events and drawing itself. Finally, we let the target state draw itself. Once all the drawing is complete, we flip the display and tick the clock. We also added a quit method to the UI class. In addition to the regular call to quit Pygame and exit, it also calls the quit method on the target state. This allows for any cleanup needed in the current state. This is now a concern because we are opening additional files beyond our Python code files. We want to make sure nothing is left open when the game actually exits. In this instance, it won't harm anything if we leave this out, but this is just good coding practice to get in the habit of doing now. Finally, the add input, add label, and add button methods have been changed to utilize the Pygame versions of these elements. Notice in all three, we are now using the location parameter. One final thing I'd like to note about Andrew's code is that you may have noticed several uses of Lambda. We didn't go over that in our Intro to Python class, so this may be completely new to some of you. Andrew made a video at the end of our class in which he explains lambdas. There is a link to it on our YouTube page, and I will also put one up in our forum. I highly recommend you watch that video. Even if you think you understand lambdas, that video will solidify your knowledge of lambdas and functions in general. It is highly informative and helped me finally understand some of the nuances I struggled with for years. There is also a short piece of example code Andrew wrote to demonstrate how and why he uses Lambda. It's definitely worth your time to walk through this code line by line and understand what is happening. That code, combined with his brief tutorial, should help you begin to understand the choices he made in his code and how to implement similar things in your own. The optional assignment for week number one is posted on the forum. Don't be intimidated by this project. It isn't as hard as it may seem. Andrew did almost all of the work for us with his 20 questions code. If you feel especially brave, I encourage you to also add in an ASCII pic of the hangman that changes with each guess. If you have questions or comments about this tutorial, the assignment, or anything to do with what we've covered thus far, please post them in the forum if possible. That way others can help and or benefit from your contributions. Thanks for watching, guys, and if you enjoyed this tutorial, please remember to subscribe to our YouTube channel and like and favorite us. Mm -hmm.